All right. I think we should be ready to go. You're ready. You look ready, Steve. Sure. Uh, we have about 75 people currently joining us via Zoom. Welcome to the Caltech Physics Colloquium. Every year we invite an eminent theoretical physicist to Caltech to give the Christie Lecture. And this year's Christie Lecture is Steve Durbin of Yale University. This lecture series honors Robert Christie, who is remembered by many in the Caltech community as an outstanding scientist and leader. Bob Christie became acquainted with Caltech when he was Robert Oppenheimer's graduate student and joined Oppie on some of his sojourns from Berkeley to Pasadena. He joined the Manhattan Project and had a pivotal role in the design of the plutonium implosion device and he remained active in nuclear policy in later years as, a, for example, a very effective advocate for a ban on atmospheric testing and participating in studies of the effect of radiation on the Japanese population. You can learn a lot about Bob Christie's life and career uh, from this insightful book written by Juliana Christie and Juliana is uh, with us today. I'm happy to see. Um, now, after the war, Bob joined the Caltech faculty and he spent the rest of his career here. He made a switch to astrophysics and made foundational contributions to the study of variable stars. And for 10 years, he was our provost, including two years as the interim president between when Harold Brown left to become defense secretary and the arrival of Murph of Goldberger. And uh, he's remembered by his many friends for his uh, rugged good looks, his athleticism, uh, his sober judgment, and most of all, perhaps, for his generosity and the selfishness with which he served Caltech an institution he loved very much. And now it's my honor to introduce another outstanding theoretical physicist, our Christie lecturer, a personal hero of mine, Steve Gervin. Steve received his PhD at Princeton with John Hopfield before Hopfield moved to Caltech. Uh, he spent some years at the National Bureau of Standards and at Indiana University before joining the Yale faculty in 2001, where he's the Higgins Professor of Physics. Steve has made many renowned contributions to the theory of highly correlated electrons. But about 20 years ago, he changed his direction towards quantum information science. And uh, since then, he and his Yale colleagues have made a huge number of innovative contributions that still reverberate in the field today. And aside from all that, uh, contributions in particular uh, having to do with the use of superconducting electrical circuits for quantum computing, still being actively pursued around the world. Amazingly, without any apparent flagging in his scientific output, Steve served for 10 years as the deputy provost for research at Yale. And more recently, he was the founding director of the Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage, one of the DOE centers recently established for quantum science in con connection with the US National Quantum Initiative. Aside from all those achievements, Steve is famous as an outstanding communicator of science, as we will witness today. And apart from all that, he's a really, really nice guy, one of the nicest people I know. And that's saying something, because I know a lot of nice people, <laughs> including, of course, all of you. So please join me in welcoming our first lecturer. Steve Gerben, who will tell us about the progress and prospects 
for the second quantum revolution. Thank you very much, John. I was looking for where you know that entire introduction was on the teleprompter. Yeah, that was very impressive. You remember more about me than I do. Um, so I hope you're a nice audience, nice and friendly. But uh, feel free to interrupt with questions. This is supposed to be for beginners, um, and just give you kind of a broad brush overview of of where things are going and these exciting uh, uh, developments. So uh, the first quantum, let's start with the first quantum revolution began 120 years ago. And the inventors of the quantum theory were struggling with cracks in the foundations of classical physics. And they were just doing completely useless, curiosity-driven fundamental research about light and atoms and, and the nature reality couldn't possibly have any applications. And they were looking at, uh, they were doing experiments like this. I'm a theorist, but I'm very proud of this experiment, which I did myself, it cost about 50 cents. You can do it in your own kitchen, get a small a compact fluorescent light bulb, shine the light through a slit, bounce it off a CD disc from your computer, and you can see it acts as a diffraction grating and you can see the discrete colors of the spectral lines emitted by light from the atoms in the bulb. And from this, people eventually figured out that atoms had quantized energy levels. And when electrons made jumps between those levels, they emitted light of different colors uh, corresponding to the energy or the frequency, you know, Planck's constant times frequency is that energy. So, you know, that seems completely useless, but very interesting. Um, and these inventors of the quantum theory had no idea that there would be devices that would follow from this practical applications that created the technology revolution of the 20th century. They couldn't foresee the transistor or the laser or atomic clocks, which led to GPS. Even the clever people who invented and very practical people who invented these devices really did not foresee their impact or all the applications they would have. Who knew that lasers would be used to you know, play music and power the internet and uh, the global positioning system was possible. They didn't foresee these things. But the second quantum revolution is being powered by a new understanding that these devices, while they're in some sense quantum, do not utilize anywhere near the full power of quantum mechanics. What do I mean by that? Well, they're quantum in the sense that the parameter values you have to tell the engineer who's making the transistor electronics, like what voltage does it take to turn on the transistor? You have to do quantum mechanics calculations to design the transistor to predict the voltage and so forth. But once you give those parameters or the frequency of the laser to the engineers, they don't need to know any quantum mechanics. The operation of these devices is effectively classical. And so it turns out they're missing some power. But let's keep going in the history a little bit. 1947, here's the first transistor. It's, I don't know, half an inch across. I think I could have done a better soldering job than that. And one of my <laughs> things I'm proud of is I know how to solder. Uh, and, you know, it's pretty ugly, uh, but it worked. But even the people who invented this could not foresee this. The, uh, CPUs containing billions of transistors. And they certainly could not foresee the current rate of trend production of transistors in the world. You probably have no idea what it is. Every second of every day, the world produces more than 20 trillion transistors. 
If they were this big, I think we would have run out of Earth at this point. Uh, it's a good thing they're very small. So just unbelievable scaling up of things that started with just curiosity-driven research. Why am I telling you all this? To insulate myself by telling you that any predictions I make in this talk, you can probably safely ignore. It's very, very difficult to see where this second quantum revolution is taking us. We just really can't foresee the consequences of realizing the full power of quantum devices. But I'm going to try to give you a, like a field guide to what's going on and what, where this might take us. But again, very hard to predict the future. So you can think of the second quantum revolution. It's nothing to do with a new theory of quantum mechanics. It's a new understanding of the content of quantum mechanics. Think of it as a three-legged stool. There's quantum materials, all kinds of exciting things going on there with artificially created unnatural materials, new natural materials that we understand better. Um, I've heard lots of interesting uh, talks this week with people doing this. The second leg is quantum sensing. From the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, we now have a much deeper understanding of how to detect the tiniest signals and how to circumvent the uncertainty principle when we need to, as is now being done in LIGO using squeezed light to enhance the uh, sensitivity to detecting the incredibly tiny fluctuations of space time due to gravitational waves. It's also being done at Yale and one other experiment using squeezing, this time with microwaves uh, in uh, a device uh, inspired by things we've done for building superconducting uh, qubits uh, to, to search for axion dark matter. Other people are doing magnetic resonance imaging of single molecules, just incredibly tiny signals. Um, and the reason this works is that quantum systems are fantastically sensitive to small perturbations. The third leg, and the one that I'm going to focus on, is processing of information, computing, communication, and simulation with computers of interesting quantum systems. Now, I just said that quantum systems are fantastically sensitive to external perturbations. That's great if you're building a sensor. It's a disaster if you're building a computer because the, the, you get what's called decoherence. You, the external world uh, has to be shut out of the computer so that it doesn't influence and, and crash the program, essentially. So, uh, you know, our host is amazing at uh, inventing acronyms that people uh, take up. And uh, so you probably all at Caltech know we're in the NISC era, noisy intermediate scale quantum era. That means the era where things don't work yet, basically. <laughs> we, we may have invented the quantum abacus or maybe the vacuum tube, for those of you who know what a vacuum tube is. Uh, we have rudimentary quantum computers. They sort of work, but they're really physics experiments. They have no, they don't work well enough to do anything useful yet. But uh, it's just beginning. So what's going on with this second quantum revolution and this new understanding of quantum mechanics and the information content of quantum states? Well, in terms of computing, it's a completely new way to store and process information it you can ask well you know where does the quantum computer get its power and actually that's a complicated question but it has to do with superposition you beginners will hear people say oh the bits are zero and one at the same time just like a particle can be in two places at once that's a shorthand which is which is incorrect uh but it's a useful shorthand uh and basically quantum uncertainty has gone from being a bug to a feature. We'll talk about that. Uh, entanglement is another kind of superposition involving more than one particle. And qubits in different parts of the computer can have non-classical correlations, which permit unexpected things like teleportation 
of states and gate operations. It's not exactly the same as Star Trek teleportation, but it's better. Um, but uh, it works for small uh, numbers of quanta. And interestingly, Einstein, who really contributed a lot of the ideas to the creation of the quantum theory, understood it so well. He understood the weirdness of this particular feature. He objected to it. He said, it's spooky action at distance. There's something wrong with the theory. And the great irony in the field today is that every morning, quantum engineers do this thing that Einstein said was impossible to calibrate the computer and make sure it is a quantum computer and not a classical computer. And I think if he were alive today, Einstein would find that pretty cool and probably understand it pretty quickly. Uh, so all of this stuff leads to a kind of massive parallelism in which a, if you could build a quantum computer, it could perform certain types of computations that are essentially impossible on any conventional computer that we could ever build, essentially. Not because they have some super fast clock speed, but rather uh, they violate the, the kind of um, foundations of quantum computer science, which uh, has been based on the idea that all hardware is polynomially equivalent. You can, you can uh, simulate any computer on any other computer with not much overhead. They're all the same. But quantum hardware, certain problems are easier to solve on quantum hardware rather than if n is the size of something uh, the number of bits in the number you're factoring or the number of entries in a database whatever something that tells you about the size of the problem some problems are known to be exponentially hard and certain quantum uh, cases uh, quantum computer that becomes only polynomially hard so uh, much easier well so what People are still trying to understand exactly what powers quantum computers and quantum machines have and try to classify things. And there's still an ongoing research topic in quantum computer science. We know that some things are classically easy. You can multiply large numbers. I can do it on my watch. Uh, but uh, finding the prime factors that led, that were multiplied to get a large number is believed to be uh, classically hard and known to be quantum easy. There is a quantum algorithm that will do that. Quantum computers are kind of natural for solving the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics. If I give you the computer a quantum state and ask it, how does it evolve in time under the Hamiltonian and what, how do you know, observables change? That's a relatively easy problem for quantum computers. And some people sort of feel naively, oh, well, all quantum problems should be easy in quantum computers. But actually, important problems, like if I don't give you the quantum state, I just give you the Hamiltonian and ask, what is the ground state? For example, does this drug molecule bind to this site with a certain affinity? You have to solve what all the electrons and the chemical bonds are doing. And uh, there are versions of that problem, that class of problems that are hard even for a quantum computer. Uh, and and uh, you know, quantum chemistry and strongly correlated systems. But so it's still an ongoing research uh, uh, process. Complexity theorists find it easier to kind of just divide the world into exponentially hard and not exponentially hard. They're, they're not as good at average case difficulty. It's easier to find worst case. Um, and, you know, there are large classes of hard problems for classical computers like uh, airline scheduling and traveling salesmen, which are provably hard or there exist provably hard instances. And people make a lot of money by solving them uh, approximately or, or pretty well uh, as, with heuristics, with things which cannot be proven to work, but which mostly do. And one of the things that your generation needs to do now that uh, quantum computers are becoming available online, start hacking around with them and develop heuristic uh, uh, quantum heuristics that will help us 
with some of these problems over here in this sector. Okay. So uh, let's start at the basics now. What's a classical bit? The key idea is that information is physical. It's stored in and transmitted by and represented by physical systems. Simple example is this circuit where uh, it has a switch and when it's open, that could be a zero and the light bulb is off. And when it's closed, that's a one and the light bulb is on and the person far away can detect whether it's a zero or one. You can communicate that bit of information. Interestingly, there are only two possible encodings for classical bits. Either the light bulb on is uh, uh, a one or it's a zero, the other way around. That's it. Um, experts will, uh, will notice I'm skipping erasure errors. Let's not worry about that. Uh, so only two possible encodings. It's going to turn out that there are an infinite number of encodings for quantum uh, bits, and that leads to some interesting complications. OK, so a quantum bit, well, what is it? Information is still physical. But now it's carried by quantum objects, objects that obey the laws of quantum mechanics. So in the past, that was always something small, like an atom or a molecule or an ion or a single photon. But nowadays, it can be something macroscopic. It can be superconducting electrical circuits that are centimeters on a side. It can be uh, mechanical systems. Uh, even 10 kilogram mirrors at LIGO uh, can be uh, pushed towards the quantum regime. And the essential feature, which I showed you earlier, is that quantum systems have discrete energy levels. And you pick out two of them, and you, typically the lowest two, but not always. And you label them 0 and 1. So those are uh, carrying our that, that bit of information. So, so far, it looks pretty much like a classical bit. Uh, and it is like a classical bit. If I measure the state of the bit, if I say, what's the energy in the atom? Is it level zero or level one? The answer is always either zero or one. Nothing else, nothing in between. Um, you get one classical bit of information when you measure the state of a quantum bit. So, so far, not much different. I have to do a little notation here because we use, sometimes we say zero and one, that's sort of computer science. Physicists can say ground and excited state, and NMR people say spin up and spin down. I'm going to talk about the Z component of the spin being plus one and minus one. These are all different notations for the same two uh, states, and I'll just randomly use them as we go through the talk, different ones. Okay, so I, so far, it looks like quantum information is digital or binary, uh, but it's also analog because quantum systems can exist in an infinity of different superposition states uh, that are combinations of up and down. And mathematically, they're defined by two angles, theta and phi, the co-latitude and the longitude on this little unit sphere called the Bloch sphere. And so the state of the qubit can, quantum bit or qubit uh, is defined by some point on this surface of this sphere. And uh, that's analog. I mean, I can continuously move it. I can also have errors develop continuously, which seems very bad. Uh, so yeah, so, so unlike classical bits, the states are continuous. They seem to be analog. And uh, so let's see what the implications of that are. So another way to look at the same thing is to say, yes, quantum bits are just like classical bits. When you measure them, you get one bit of information. You get a discrete result. But it turns out there are an infinite number of encodings. And by encodings, the physicist really means quantization axis. So here is the two traditional actors in the field, Alice and Bob. Alice has chosen this quantization axis or this encoding. So this is her um, uh, zero and one, or Z is plus one and minus one. Bob has chosen a different one. And if Bob prepares Z prime is plus one and hands it to Alice, 
in her encoding, you have to transform it to her encoding. It's a superposition of her z is plus one and her z is minus one. And these quantum amplitudes tell you the probability that uh, what Alice will measure when she measures z. And it's random. So this is the first bad sounding thing. When you all of this, all kinds of randomness in our quantum computer when we make measurements. So Alice measures z is plus one with this probability, where theta is this angle between the encodings, and minus one with this probability. Well, that sounds strange and bad, um, but there's more, even worse things. So when Al, so here's Alice with her Z measuring apparatus, maybe a stern girl like magnet for the physicist. And Bob hands her this uh, superposition state on the equator. It goes through and she says, oh, I see it with Z is minus one. And she can measure it again and it'll be minus one. But then Bob hands her the same state again, and this time it randomly comes out plus one. She says, oh, I see it's plus one. She measures it again to make sure it's still plus one. But there's so she, the fact that her the act of her measuring it changed the state is invisible to her. If she didn't know what the state was before, all she knows is what came out of the measurement apparatus. So this back action or state collapse is intrinsic, but she can't see it. And this is going to turn out to be a scary fact when you try to figure out how to correct quantum errors, which I'll talk about later. So I love this saying from my friend Sasha Karatkov that explains this about uh, things before you measure them, they don't have values. So in quantum mechanics, you don't see what you get. It's not random because it had a value when you opened the box and you looked to see what it was. You get what you see. The act of you measuring something brings into existence the value of the thing you measure. So you shouldn't say that the superposition was both zero and one. You should say that this Z measurement does not have a value until I make the measurement. Okay. Well, why, why does randomness enter quantum mechanics? So you know, I'm kind of telling you all things that you all know, but I'm just trying to give a, a kind of personal perspective on this. Why, why does it have to be randomness in quantum mechanics? Well, we have to reconcile the fact that the qubits seem to be binary. When I measure their value, I always get z is plus one or minus one, or z prime is plus one or minus one. I have to um, reconcile that with the fact that there's an analog nature. There's a continuous variation of encodings or quantization axes. And so the only way to reconcile those two things, analog and digital, is to have randomness. The measurement results are always discrete, but the probability distribution for those results varies continuously with the encoding. That's the only way to reconcile uh, these things. So randomness has to be there. Okay, and this will play an important role in designing quantum algorithms, as I will talk about. Okay, so a classical register of n bits can be in one of two to, n, two to the n states. Here are three bits, can be in eight states running from binary zero to binary seven. Uh, so a quantum register can hold an exponentially large superposition of all possible two to the n states. And you can, interestingly, a quantum computer can create these giant superpositions in one time step, at least simple versions of it, say with all plus signs. And it doesn't have to be plus ones and minus one. These are all complex numbers, but I'm just writing this down for simplicity. So if you had a small computer, computers today have billions of bits. A small quantum computer with only 53 qubits has a state space dimension of 10 to the 16. So that's gigantic. It's so big that it's just at the limits of what you can simulate solving the Schrodinger equation on classical computers today. And this is really, really at the limit and requires special tricks to do. So you don't need a very big quantum computer if all the bits are working well 
to get into a domain that we've never entered before and can't classically simulate. So, uh, so think about this. In one, one step in the computer, I can create a superposition of all possible inputs that I could ever give the computer in the input register. And the answer I want is one of those numbers. It's already in there. Fantastic. But when I make a measurement of the output register, there's a bug. I'm going to collapse this to one of these exponentially many states and just get you know one number. And there's only one chance in two to the 53, say, that I land on the right answer. So that begs the question, how, with all this randomness going on, how can quantum algorithms produce useful results instead of random noise? And that's a pretty interesting question. And we don't actually know that much about how to des systematically design quantum algorithms. Uh, and you'll see that it's, it's pretty strange. So, so you, these numbers, as I said in the superposition, don't have to be plus one and minus one. They're complex numbers. And I don't have really time to explain it, but the physicists will understand that these have kind of, are kind of a wave-like uh, amplitudes. And you can add and subtract them and interfere them. And so the purpose of the quantum computer algorithm or program is to apply wave-like destructive interference to all the amplitudes in front of the wrong answers, driving them towards zero, and constructive interference in front of the right answers, driving them towards one, so that when you make a measurement, you're very unlikely to get the wrong answer and very likely to get the right answer with high probability. So that's your goal as a quantum uh, algorithm developer. And so it's a little bit like having the, uh, the computer is like a programmable diffraction grating. I showed you that CD disk as a diffraction grating. It sorted, it did a Fourier transform. It sorted the light by wavelength. And you can, uh, by making diffraction gratings and putting holes and, and mirrors in different places in some pattern, you can take a, a, an input that's spread everywhere and block the ones that are going to the wrong answer and constructively reinforce the one waves that are going to the right answer. And then the intensity will be shining on the right answers. The answers are distributed along the way. So that's, that's kind of an analogy. It's not perfect, but it's not completely wrong. And uh, here you see some you know, physical examples of uh, diffraction patterns. But here's an interesting question, which I didn't think about until I gave this talk uh, to a version of this talk to uh, a group of high school students in New Jersey who had started a quantum uh, group. And you know, I said, well, wait a minute. How do you design the diffraction grading to give the right answer when you don't know what the answer is? And I stopped and thought about it. I said, well, that's, that's the grand challenge of algorithm development. How do you... How do you make the right program that focuses on the answer when you don't know what the answer is? And you know that this is a kind of funny picture of algorithm development, but it gives you a hint about why we still don't. We have a few examples of things that we figured out, quantum Fourier transforms and stuff, but uh, there's a lot of intuition we haven't built up yet on how to solve problems by writing algorithms on quantum computers. And this is sort of encapsulates that problem. All right, so what kind of hardware is used to build quantum computers? Well, trapped ions, uh, there's experiments here at Caltech on uh, Rydberg arrays, uh, things called quantum dots in silicon that uh, uh, some people like because it's also similar to computer chips. Uh, I will, uh, I focus on superconducting electrical circuits. And again, we don't know what technology is gonna be the best. And some of you young people in the audience may find something completely different that will be much better than this and, and put us all out of business, which uh, would be sad for me, but very, very good for you. Uh, so 
uh, we think about superconducting electrical circuits. We like that because it makes for an all electronic quantum processor. And the first, it, it's, uh, here's the first all electronic quantum processor. It's built only 12 years ago in 2009. It was a huge machine. It had two quantum bits, one here and one here, connected by a microwave resonator. And the algorithm worked, they communicated and, and acted on each other and did logic by exchanging virtual microwave photons through this uh, bus. And it's a nice setup because it's lithographically produced by the same techniques that you make integrated circuits, but you replace the semiconductors by superconductors. And uh, as I said, this was done by my colleagues in 2009. And the, the current machines at Google and IBM and Intel and Forgetti and other places are massive uh, and complicated, but direct engineering scale ups of this first incredibly crude device, which is only 12 years old. So what, what is the, what is the it, uh, qubit? It's a kind of artificial atom. We call it a transmon qubit for funny historical reasons. Here's a picture. It's, uh, you take a very hot, pure piece of sapphire, very good insulator, you evaporate two halves of a dipole antenna about a millimeter long and uh, you know very thin, and you connect the two halves with a Josephson tunnel junction. It's just aluminum and another piece of aluminum, and there's a little uh, few nanometer thick aluminum oxide insulating barrier that the electrons can't go through, except Electrons are waves because they're quantum. They can tunnel through this forbidden region, actually in pairs because it's superconducting. And the sloshing of the electrons back and forth are the excited states of this artificial atom. And so you can think of this thing. It has about a trillion mobile electrons. It's like an atom with atomic number a trillion. Well, boy, that's way past uranium. That's got to have a really complicated spectrum, you think. But no, because it's superconducting, the, you eliminate all the single particle excitations. All of these pairs of electrons condense into one giant coherent condensate, and they slosh together back and forth across the junction. And the junction turns this into a weakly anharmonic oscillator with a, uh, instead of a quadratic potential in the coordinate, it's a cosine. And so uh, the spectrum is very simple. It's simpler than hydrogen. It's just, uh, you know, weakly anharmonic oscillator. There's no fine structure, no hyperfine structure. And amazingly, uh, with the progress we've made over the last 20 years, the quality factor, that is, if you think of this as roughly a harmonic oscillator, and you multiply the frequency of the oscillation, by how long it lasts, you get the Q of the oscillator. It's about the same as the hydrogen 1s 2p uh, transition you know, 10 minutes. Uh, but what's, uh, what is different than hydrogen is this guy has a huge antenna attached to it. It has a, what's called a transition dipole moment. The zero point uncertainty of the charge is about three or four Cooper pairs moving a millimeter. So that's a five orders of magnitude bigger uh, coupling to microwaves or a light than a natural atom. And we use this uh, uh, to be able to do nonlinear quantum optics at the single microwave photon level. So we call this circuit quantum electrodynamics in analogy to cavity QED. Uh, uh, but done with microwaves instead of uh, la lasers and natural atoms. We use our artificial atoms. So why do we have to cool these things down near absolute zero? Well, to make them superconducting, to get rid of the friction, the resistance when the current flows, you have to be below about one Kelvin, uh, just above absolute zero. But the other thing you have to know is that if this had a transition frequency of 21 gigahertz, you multiply that by Planck's constant, that, that corresponds to Boltzmann's constant times one Kelvin. 
So a one Kelvin, uh, if you had a really good refrigerator and got down to one Kelvin, the walls would look so hot to the atom. They'd be just pouring black body radiation onto the atom and exciting it up. That would be a disaster. So we have to cool it to within one hundredth of a degree of absolute zero to get rid of that. And that used to be a big hassle. But nowadays, uh, uh, you, uh, you can buy a fridge for a mere $700,000 and uh, plug it in and 24 hours later, it's cold. And the best part is you don't have to write a grant to get the helium and the provost has to pay for the electricity. So it's, uh, I used to say that was a disadvantage when I had my other job. But, uh, okay, so it's gotta be very, very cold. Now, there are some problems. I already told you that the quantum states are, their, their strength is this huge superpositions, but their Achilles heel is those superpositions are fantastically sensitive to noise, perturbations and dissipation. And uh, so for example, the phase of a superposition, whether this is plus or e to the i pi over three or minus, that changes with time when in, in a time called T2, the coherence time, when there are perturbations from the environment. And that ruins the whole quantum calculation. But despite the sensitivity, we've made exponential progress in qubit coherence times uh, by just you know, new designs and better materials and so forth. And we've increased uh, from the 1999, the first uh, Superconducting qubit by Nakamura in Japan had uh, maybe a T1 of a couple of nanoseconds and the T2 was not measurable. Uh, and now we're up, uh, here's a recent example, a 1.5 millisecond uh, qubit at the uh, University of Maryland and single qubit gate fidelities of four nines. So comparable to, you know, ion traps and, and real atoms. Uh, and uh, so there's been, you know, five, at least five orders of magnitude improvement. And there's more to be had, although things have slowed down. So we'll see, we've got to refocus on this. Uh, but it doesn't matter. They, you could make three more orders of magnitude in progress. You still have to deal with the iron law of quantum devices, which is that there's no such thing as too much coherence. You know, if I make the coherence one second, I'm a hero. And then the software people come and say, I got this circuit I want to run for a really hard problem. It needs to run for 10 seconds. You just can't win against those guys. So, so uh, you know, there's no limit to coherence as a resource. It's it more and more is better and better. So we need quantum error correction. And this is a, a pretty interesting topic, one I'm quite excited about. So uh, let's start with uh, comparing digital and analog computers. So in a digital computer, the, you know, the transistor voltage or something, if it's near less than, uh, if it's near zero, we call it a zero. If it's near one, we call it a one. If there's some noise, it doesn't matter. It's still interpreted correctly as a one, as long as the noise is smaller than you know half of this distance. Here you see this uh, poor engineer in 1964 programming one of these analog computers by plugging uh, patch cables together, not a job that uh, would probably be very fun. Um, and uh, it's uh, very, very different. And analog computers in some sense have more power because they use real numbers but all real numbers are possible states of the machine and you can't tell whether an error happened essentially. And uh, so there's a no go theorem that says you really can't do error correction in analog devices. And I told you quantum bits are kind of analog. So now we're getting nervous. Can you do quantum error correction? And so here's the quantum error correction problem in a nutshell for you to solve. Here's the challenge. I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state plucked out of the middle of some quantum computation. Even I don't know what it is. It's big and complicated. If you measure it, if you go to look for errors and measure it, the state will change randomly by this back action or state collapse effect that I told you about. Your job, if an error develops, is to fix it. 
It sounds impossible, but miraculously it is possible. And personally for me, the fact that this is possible in principle is even more amazing than the possibility of quantum computing itself with perfect devices. So how does quantum error correction work? So you build what's called a logical qubit that holds as logical zero or a logical one in a quantum state. But the quantum state is spread over many physical qubits, n qubits here, nine, and uh, in some non-local correlation so that no single qubit, physical qubit, knows the logical state. So if the environment collapses the state of that one qubit, it doesn't learn the state of the logical qubit and the collapse isn't somehow complete. It doesn't destroy the logical qubit. And you have to do very special, very complicated multi-qubit measurements like four-bit correlators uh, to learn where the error is. And there are a lot of errors. Each of these qubits could have three different errors, you know, fit, fit, play, phase slip, or both. And there's nine of them. So there are 27 possible errors. You have to make a bunch of very complicated measurements to locate those errors. And, but uh, miraculously, errors are analog. They're continuous. They slowly develop. But when you measure these error syndromes, these multi-qubit things, you always get a discrete result. If you measure plus one, there was no error. Now remember the state collapses. I don't know whether there was an error before, but I have brought into existence the fact that there is no error by measuring that there is no error. If I get a minus one, then there's an error and I have to, do, I have to figure out how to, how to correct it. So in this case, strangely enough, state collapse is our friend, that it makes continuous errors into discrete errors and we can circumvent the no-go theorem for analog quantum error correction. Okay, well, so we have to build a Maxwell demon that you know rapidly makes all these tests, makes the measurements, fixes the errors. It's effectively uh, you know, pumping entropy caused by the errors out of this thing into some cold bath. And there's a problem. If I'm gonna make a logical qubit out of N physical qubits, I just took a giant step backwards because each qubit has errors. So the total error rate just went up by a factor of n, in this case, nine. It's much worse. But because of the special entangled state that I'm using, I can correct some of those errors if there aren't too many. And so the job of the Maxwell demon is to be so fast and so efficient that it overcomes this factor of n, gets you back to where you started, and then gets you even above this so-called break-even point where you're making the logical lifetime of the information longer than the lifetime of any of the individual physical components. And this has been a huge challenge for people working with qubits and getting close, but it hasn't really been, uh, really been cleanly uh, accomplished yet. So, um, so we have a, we're pursuing a different idea. Don't use material objects at all as the qubits, but store the quantum information in microwave photon states in high cube, high quality factor superconducting resonators. And uh, so you have a, an aluminum box, it's superconducting, it traps the microwaves in here. Uh, we still need the thing that was the qubit to help us control the state of this uh, harmonic, it's a harmonic oscillator and it has quantized energy levels. And these integers are just telling you how many photons are in the state. So I can make superpositions of zero photons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. So that sounds to, um, one of the things we like is that sounds impossible to optical physicists. So we'll just show you some data here. Here's some resonator, there's the controller. You put drives on the resonator and the controller, some crazy shape that's determined by uh, computer optimization. And you can take the cavity from zero photons through some intermediate states 
500 nanoseconds later, there's exactly six photons in the cavity. And not well, a non-classical state. We can also do tomography. We can measure that state. Uh, this is called, uh, for the experts, that will recognize this as a Wigner function. It's kind of the quasi-probability distribution of the oscillator in phase space. Here's the coordinate, the electric field inside the uh, cavity. Here's the momentum, the magnetic field inside the oscillator. And you see all these ripples where it changes sign. And you see perfect rotational symmetry. Why? That's the number phase uncertainty. There's exactly six photons. You're completely uncertain what the phase of the oscillator is. And uh, the key enabling technology to measure this is the ability to measure photon number parity, whether the photon number is even or odd, uh, without measuring the number itself. I don't have time to explain why that is, but I always mention it to make optical physicists jealous. It's relatively easy to do because we have these giant antennas on our ancilla qubits to help us couple to the photons. So now we have this control over individual photon states. How do we use them to make error correctable logical qubits? Well, the nice thing about oscillators is their, their main error is amplitude damping. If you have five photons, it eventually falls to four and three and two and one and zero. Um, it's a very simple error model, and it happens in one single mode. There are nine different physical qubits. There's just one oscillator that has a lot of levels with a simple error model. So you can make a code. Here is zero logical. It consists of a superposition of states with zero photons and four photons. And one logical consists of a state with exactly two photons. You can see they're orthogonal if you had a quantum force. So they're perfectly fine uh, logical qubit states. And I can measure the parity. You notice these are all even numbers by design. If I were to lose a photon, the parity would become odd. And if I can measure the parity, I know there's an error. That's the only kind of error there is, is a parity jump. And I can uh, do something clever with my universal control to restore the state and correct the error. And uh, so um, let's see. So yeah, so there's a, you know, you, you, if the parity jumps, you get these states. And then uh, I see that and I apply what's called a unitary operation to take the error state back to the state it came from and get rid of the error. And uh, so, um, I don't, I've run out of time, so I won't explain this data, but this experiment did use this exact code, we call the binomial code, uh, to come very, very close to the break even point, uh, which I have to define for you for oscillators, but it, it's um, uh, quite close to this uh, break even point, which is the information lasts as long as a single photon in the cavity lasts. Uh, so we're, it's still very early days. There's a whole series of steps. Everybody's trying to climb towards the, the ultimate goal of fault tolerant large scale quantum computer systems. And uh, we're just reaching the point where error correction is almost working. We're, 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 there are a few experiments I didn't show you that have done slightly better than break even, some still unpublished. Uh, but we need to be 10 or 100 times beyond break even to really extend the coherence time so that we can run the algorithms for a long time. And uh, so, you know, th this is very, very challenging. We've made huge progress, but we still have a long, long way to go. Uh, but I hope I've convinced you that when it comes to quantum mechanics, you have to think different, that quantum information is carried by waves and particles. It's both analog and digital, and that quantum error correction, surprisingly, is possible. And really, the big idea behind the second quantum revolution is not a new theory of quantum mechanics, but a new understanding of the old theory, and that certain features of quantum weirdness uh, and uncertainty can be features rather than bugs in the program of the universe. So uh, thanks, and I'm happy to take questions.
Okay, it looks like we have plenty of time for questions for Steve. My uh, responsibility was to monitor the questions from the Zoom audience. We had about 100 people, but uh, and I was smart enough to bring my laptop, but not smart enough to make sure its battery was charged. Uh, <laughs> so you might want well, I can maybe I can look for it. Sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Right. Okay. I don't see any yet. There's one. Yeah. Oh, so the 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 resonator is a harmonic oscillator. It doesn't have the absent the ancilla. It doesn't have a dosing factor there. Uh, so uh, that's a problem because the transition frequency between all the levels is exactly the same. So if I try to make a transition from zero to one with a pulse, once it gets to one, it keeps going to two. So you actually need this nonlinear oscillator, the thing that used to be the qubit, to help us control that thing and produce the Fox phase. Uh, it does sadly inherit a tiny bit of nonlinearity when you couple the enharmonic oscillators to it, but it, it's pretty tiny and uh, we have ways to deal with that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yeah, this so, uh, person here works at H bar equals zero, but I will allow him to ask the question. <laughs> no, not always. Not, not always, <laughs> but yeah. Leo, sorry. Well, so you mentioned in the introduction uh, hard problems for quantum computers. Yeah. Like quantum chemistry, let's say. So I'm just wondering if like, there must be some additional restrictions in that definition because, like, you know, you evolve an experiment. Yeah. And it gives you a result. You, you know, it's yeah. Not, so it's not programmable, but it does give you a result and it doesn't do it in an you know, exponentially large time in the number of atoms or something. Right. But it's not programmable. So I, I think that, okay, I'm not a complexity expert, uh, but they're in the class of such problems. I give you a Hamiltonian finding the ground state. There are hard instances, you know, sign problems. The fermions, uh, frustration of the spins, those kinds of things. Uh, there exist out there in the universe of all possible Hamiltonians, very difficult ones. Some are trivial, you can solve them with a uh, product state, you know, or uh, so they're not all hard. And uh, if I give you a piece of uh, uh, high TC superconductors, probably a strongly correlated system. Uh, it solves its Schrodinger equation, no problem, but uh, it's, you know, you can't use that. You can't uh, do anything with that, right? You can't program that. So I think that's the right response that all experts can do. Steve, you, uh, quite appropriately emphasize that we have a long way to go. Right. Uh, we want hardware that performs much better. We also are going to need a lot more physical qubits to run the algorithms that we aspire to. Yeah. It, what scares you the most <laughs> that might potentially pro prove to be a serious obstacle to yeah. realizing large scale quantum computing? Yeah, that's a good question. I also see one in the chat and see if I can come to. So, well, thank you. Uh, Oh, you can see them too. Okay. Uh, be careful what you write up there, guys. Uh, <laughs> so, what are the big obstacles? Well, of course, there are engineering obstacles, like, uh, you know, getting all those control wires from room temperature down to low temperatures. Maybe you can't, that doesn't scale well with the number of qubits. You probably want some serial to parallel thing. Those are pretty standard engineering problems, you know, kind of extreme limits and so forth. Uh, those can probably be solved in one time. Uh, but I think myself, what, what I'm most scared about is just how darn hard quantum air correction is. Mm -hmm. And um, we really have to make all the 
little tiny parts better and better and make them into small modules that are really good. And then the experts can scale that up, I think. But the performance, the, the, the gate fidelity, the coherence times have to be really fantastic because the error corrections themselves, circuits themselves, use the same component. And so they also make mistakes. So you have to have this fault tolerance design. That's really, really hot. And it gets easier if all the parts get better. Although the very human point then <laughs> moves up also. So that's what keeps me awake at night. I think it's an extremely interesting problem. And I think uh, we have to find new air correction codes, new and better qubits, just all the parts have to be better, both at the kind of machine language level and at the transistor level. Uh, and I think that's, to me, the grand challenge. Once we get, once we get air correction, I, I don't imagine that you can if you get to low error rates, you can concatenate these error correction codes and drive the errors down theoretically to extremely low levels. But when they get down to be fantastically low, you're going to discover some tiny little error that you were totally negligible before is now dominating and it wasn't in the error model. There's going to be lots of challenges. But that'll be a quality problem to have. We have to get much better to start having those kind of quality problems. Okay, uh, different error correcting codes are being explored. Uh, well, um, you know, people are looking at this. So for the experts, people are looking at surface codes. There are now modifications and evolutions of the surface code that are much better, have higher thresholds. Um, the surface code has rate zero. It's roughly, it stores uh, one logical bit per arbitrarily large number of physical qubits. Uh, we're fans of these bosonic codes. We've demonstrated all kinds of things, but not a lot yet with super high fidelity and not well beyond break even yet. So nobody has a clear winning uh, uh, code yet. Uh, we're very interested in qubits that have highly biased noise. They mostly have Z errors and very rarely have bit flip errors. Turns out that makes error correction much easier, for example. So there's all, there's just, it's just wide open. The field's just barely beginning. But to make progress at this early stage, personally, you have to, I think, you have to understand what's going on with the electrons. You have to really understand the noise and junk in, the, in hardware pretty well. It's not, you know, once we get it working well at the hardware level, software people can think about fancier codes on top of this. But until the until first progress is to understand how to eke out better performance from the bad uh, current bad hardware. So would it be fair to say we've got a lot of basic research to do? Absolutely. Ready to turn it over to the engineer? Right. I mean, there's of course fantastic new engineering challenges that so electrical engineers. And computer architects can, can get involved with now. But um, basic research, much basic research, still needs to be done. And uh, remember, that's where this all came from 100 years ago completely useless looking things. And we need more completely useless looking things, which will suddenly become very relevant. All right, well, we need our top that calls for uselessness. Yes. <laughs> One great uh, point in which to end the lecture. Let's start to see. Thank you. Thanks for the question.